two weeks of fishing. And that was it. Right. And then all of a sudden the ice was gone and the fishermen had to leave. And, right. uh, I've seen very few snowmobiles out there on the water this year. And of course, water skiing has been missing now for oh, three years. Yeah. We don't see the crowds we used to see. Right. You live right in Mayville, Doc? Right on the lake, yeah. Do you, uh, were you born in this area, Doc? I, I was born and brought up in Cattaraugus. Whereabouts? Cattaraugus. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what, that's good. What did your, uh, what did your mom and dad do? Uh, both just laborers, common peons, I call them. Yeah. My father was a blacksmith. Mm -hmm. uh, actually chewed horses as he was a kid growing up. Mm -hmm. And lived in the Nag Frontier in Lockport, New York. Okay. And enlisted in World War One. Right. My mother worked for a place which is still available. It's called Setter Six. Okay. They uh, make these little lollipop sticks. Mm-hmm. And uh, just factory workers. Nice people. Where did you graduate from high school? Well, I never graduated because those days you were allowed to enter if your administration allowed you to. Mm -hmm. You could leave early, leave school early, and without your diploma. So there were about five or six of us in my senior class who left in February of our senior year, enlisted together. Right. Never saw one another again until the day we got discharged. Now, what year would that have been, Doc? I beg your pardon? What year? 1942. 42. Yeah. So it was, what do you remember about February, or about December 7th, 1941, when President Roosevelt got on the radio? What do you remember about that? My extreme thoughts were, what the hell is this? Yeah. And uh, at that time, my ship, the one that I'd been on for over two years, was headed for Japan for which would have been the invasion, the original invasion of Japan. Now, what ship were you on? USS Cepheus. Cepheus? Which is a transport ship. Well, how do you spell that? C E P H E U S. Okay. So talk about you. Did you you enlisted in the uh, Navy? The, you enlisted? Oh, yes. Uh, in 1942? Yes. And then where did you go from there? Well, they ran us a uh, typical service. I was telling the, the gentleman who brought me here that uh, I tried to enlist in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. The first doctor turned me down because my bite was misshapen. And I had a little bit of an argument with the guy who was examining me. I told him I'd been eating for 17 years and looked <laughs> healthy. Well, I couldn't continue to eat even though I was in service, but he didn't want any part of me. And I wanted to be a hero. So, and I had an older brother who had been in service for four years. And uh, I said, let's go. You're going to help me get into service. And he was home from uh, Fort Lauderdale where he had been for four years. And uh, I ducked into the Marine office, and uh, he grabbed me by the collar, and he said, get out of there. <laughs> so I said, why? And he said, you don't want to go in there. You're too young. And uh, I said, well, I'm going anyway. 
So I did, and the doctor there uh, approved of me and said, you'll be okay. And the next thing I know, I was on my oath of allegiance to Cleveland, Ohio. Right. You know, they did crazy things, and they sent us all over creation. Why we had to go to from uh, my hometown to Buffalo to uh, to Rochester, and from Rochester uh, we went back to uh, went to Cleveland. Or did I say that? Hmm. Anyway, we ended up in Cleveland taking the oath of office. And from there, we were separated to go our own ways in different directions for different reasons. And uh, three of us ended up down Manhattan Beach uh, for a rookie training. And uh, Manhattan Beach at that time was a recruiting station, and uh, that's where we actually entered the service. And from that point on, we entered in uh, Cleveland, and from that point on, then they shipped us back to Manhattan Beach, where uh, we were in different companies. Uh, and then from that point on, we were separated entirely. And uh, my first three weeks in service, I guarded the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, it was called at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, prayed of refugees coming in from other countries trying to make it into the United States. Did guard duty with them, uh, ate with them, slept with them. Uh, in the uh, patrol group that was with me at that time was uh, Caesar DeMero, the movie star. Yes, yes. Willie Pep was the guy's name who was a prize fighter uh, and a champion at that time. Yep. He slept right next to me. And I used to get mad at him because uh, uh, he was a little shell shocked at that time. That's what we used to call it, shell shocked. And uh, he got front and scream, screaming out of his head, and <laughs> wake up everybody in the camp at that time. And that's the type that well, I spent about two weeks there, and then they shipped me to. Uh, Ellis Island for shore patrol duty. And uh, I guess there were some people there who wanted to steal the Statue of Liberty or something, I don't know why, but we, we guarded the statue. And uh, there were a few people who were trying to get into the country or trying to sneak out of the country, and we had some words to say to one another. Nobody ever got shot or anything like that, but we were there to just check and make sure who the people were that were either going into, coming into the United States or leaving the United States. And uh, I spent three weeks there, uh, four hours on, eight hours off, right in with the rest of the uh, the people, the, uh, the foreigners who were trying to enter into the United States, ate with them, slept with them, laughed with them, joked with them, listened to their stories about how they'd like to get it into the United States and so forth. And uh, finally, they, somebody got the word that, that I wasn't feeling well and that I'd been in way over my head in hours. They forgot and left me there. So uh, I, I was sent back to the camp that I'd originally been assigned to with pneumonia. And uh, 
no sooner walked into the camp than I think it was Cesar Romero said, come on, you're going. I said, going where? He said, you're going on board a ship with us. And uh, we did. I got uh, uh, assigned to the USS Cepheus, which was being commissioned that year. And uh, sent to the naval, uh, the boatyard in, in Brooklyn. First thing I knew, we were on a, a shakedown cruise uh, down the Chesapeake Bay. As a matter of fact, uh, we encountered, we didn't, I shouldn't use the word encountered, but uh, we were pursuing and watching and cautious of a German submarine that was right in that area, apparently checking us all over as we were going on our shakedown crew up and down the Chesapeake. Well, then we came back from there, went back to Brooklyn, and from Brooklyn, next thing I knew we were going across the North Atlantic uh, to Liverpool, England. Uh, and everybody could tell what was coming, an, an invasion of Europe by the United States. And, uh, well, that's the way it, it happened. We were sent from Liverpool. We'd just been there for about a couple of weeks. And that was kind of shocking because uh, England had been pretty well hit by the war at that time. And it was nothing but rubble. Especially Liverpool, and uh, I can remember uh, talking with uh, what do you call the big uh, uh, military people from England, uh, the big tall guys, uh, cops. Oh, the Bobbies. But, yeah, the Bobbies. And, yeah, and uh, they were nice people. They helped us out because most of the time we were walking around in fog in England, and all of a sudden we got orders, you're going to Liverpool, England, no, Glasgow, Glasgow, Scotland, uh, for training with submarine crews or landing barge crews uh, to get ready for invasions of Normandy in Europe and so forth. So uh, we spent maybe 10 days in uh, Glasgow. I remember they were in the beds in the place that we were in. I slept in the bathtub. <laughs> I'll always remember that. <laughs> At least I had a place to sleep, but it was cold. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, from that, from Glasgow, which I thought I would always like to go back to. It was such a clean place. It had not been uh, touched by the war as such. Uh, it was interesting because it was a submarine base and, and we watched the subs coming in and out and off duty, non duty, and so forth. And the next thing I know, we're on our way to Plymouth, England. And uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower called the invasion off because stormy weather. Mm -hmm. uh, that lasted maybe two days. And uh, we were assigned at that time as uh, watchdogs and the perimeter of the invasion. We took in. Uh, an outfit called the 45th Rangers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the troops that went in, some of them were weathermen for the invasion. And uh, that, that uh, to me, that uh, invasion was a fouled up mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me, but uh, nothing worked. And uh, everything they tried. For example, drop your paratroopers inside 
German forces who were on the outside have them move this way towards the beach where the Germans were in Sizzermaw, but our guiders landed in swamps, in soil that no plane could possibly land in and come out uh, untouched. So uh, that didn't go over good. Uh, that was one of Mike Eisenhower's plans, mm -hmm. which I think backfired tremendously. And, uh, well, you guys know the story of the invasion. Uh, there were three beaches, Juneau, Red Beach, and uh, Omaha. And uh, the one beach was, well, it had, uh, I call them cliffs, but they were kind of wall-like fortresses, like about as tall as that wall there. That the troops had to scan to get up on top where the Germans were and where their fortresses were. They had pretty good size, well, we call them 16 inch guns. I, I don't know what they really were, but they were firing down on the troops until uh, a couple of guys in the army got real smart and decided we better go up there anyway or we're all going to get shot down. So a uh, couple of guys led the pack and went up and the, the invasion took over. And uh, it was pretty well settled when we got orders to uh, go to southern France. So we went around the Bay of Biscay uh, and encountered uh, troops from both sides going in and out of the invasion, uh, right out in the water. Shot at, shot with, uh, got out of there in a hurry. <laughs> uh, what kind of boat did you have? You had a, a, was yours your ship? This was my ship, which carried LCMs and LCVPs. Okay. These were the landing barges themselves. Right. But we carried I think around 36 of those landing barges, LCMs, LCVPs, mm -hmm. and we had 40-some uh, uh, 20 millimeter machine guns, which could fire uh, 60 shots in a minute. That was a terrific gun. Yep. Uh, and. Uh, I was appointed gunner's mate, uh, somewhere along the way in there. Uh, I was working on a, one of the 20 millimeters. <coughs> I had it all torn apart and I was cleaning it. And uh, parts all over the place, in the gun deck. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, alarm came across, red alert, fire at will, sirens went off, uh, people manned their guns, there was some firing action, uh, and then all of a sudden that alarm was called off, returned to normal, and Everybody went back to work except my gun, and I was a, uh, in the armistice department. I was a gunner's mate, had this gun all torn apart, laying on parts laying on a table like that. And when we put them together and went back to firing, uh, Every 20 millimeter that we had stopped firing, except the one I'd been working on. Really? The reason mine didn't work is I had put the sear in upside down. <laughs> so uh, that was a laughing stock of the ship for quite some time. And even when the captain 
left the ship at New Guinea, uh, he sat there double take. He was saying goodbye to the troops on board, and he did, did a double take, and he came back. And he, he looked me square in the eye, and he said, "I know you." <laughs> he said, "You're the guy who left the gun, the steering upside down." <laughs> I thought, "Oh, good Lord, here I go another five days in the brig." <laughs> did you spend time in the brig? I did that time. They didn't go after me. But really? <laughs> yeah, I put three other times in the brig. What for? What caused Doc Malinowski to be put in a brig? <laughs> well, I was a wise kid, for one. Uh, we went across the North Atlantic. It was the middle of winter, besides being awfully, awfully cold. And we had on everything we could find except our sea bags to stay warm. And orders would come through every once in a while, uh, exercise the guns so they wouldn't freeze up. And uh, we had a fellow there from New Mexico, we called him Pancho. And we were all connected with fire control, uh, which determined when we'd shoot and who we'd shoot at and how we'd shoot and so forth. And we all had contact with fire control central office. And uh, somewhere along out in there near Iceland or Greenland or someplace, order, we had to exercise these guns every once in a while. And it was, just miserable cold. It had on everything but your sea bag. And uh, Pancho, the guy on the phone with uh, the, out, the outfit with fire control, Pancho, they said, uh, okay, exercise your guns. And Pancho, the guy who had the phones on, and I the gun that I had been working on and so forth, answered back, go to hell, five days, <laughs> five days. <laughs> and uh, that's where we sent it in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny part about it was, uh, the brig had all the room, quarter the size of this room. Well, you got your, I'll say, bread and water. <laughs> you had a big T on your back. They paraded each up and down the decks for a nourishment. Nourishment was, you know, being punk. And uh, there in my cell where I was, there was a uh, air filler came from the deck down to the where there was another guy and I were located and my buddies fixed me up by dropping candy bars down that vent where <laughs> we were waiting to get some good solid food down below <laughs> being punk. <laughs> and uh, I used to get a big charge out of it because each week the doctor would come in and weigh us. And I gained eight pounds when I was <laughs> <laughs> Doctor never understood it. <laughs> but uh, got out of that and uh, there were a couple other times when when he ended. Well, because you were a wise guy? Victim of circumstances. Ah, okay. One, <laughs> well, well, we went uh, on liberty mm -hmm. from one ship to another one, a sister ship, mm -hmm. right in the bay. And, uh, when it came time Liberty was up to go back to ship, uh, 
four or five of us got on the wrong Liberty boat and went back to the wrong ship. <laughs> <laughs> and the captain on the ship said, you keep them, we don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go again. <laughs> Another five days. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, the last time we were uh, zigzagging, mm -hmm. you guys know all about that. And, uh, it was a, uh, we were a pretty good sized ship. We were 500 feet long. And, uh, Every once in a while, the whole flotilla would zigzag to keep the, the sub from really tracking us down. And, uh, well, I had enough of it. <laughs> and there was a young Lieutenant J.G. there who, another one of those 90 day wonders. <laughs> and, uh, he kept giving us five yards this way and five yards that way and five and back and forth and back and forth and I was on, on the helm and finally I told him, hell, we're not in the tugboat back in New York Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> that was five more days. <laughs> so I was up for a court martial. I, uh, I was up for captain's mass. I, I had the captain's mass, but if one more I'd have had a court martial, and you know I could have been discharged. And, and Captain Surratt was gracious to us because he left the ship in uh, New Guinea, getting ready for the invasion of, of uh, southern. Uh, of, uh, going to Japan. Right. And uh, when he left, there were maybe 50 of us who had been placed on report for a jumping ship in New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, when he left the ship, uh, our skipper, his name was Surratt, he was a, a Cherokee Indian, uh, absolved all of those mistakes, washed the slate clean, and uh, abolished all of those penalties. And he went on to another ship. He came back to the United States, and we got a, what we call a 90 day wonder to come on in. And uh, on our way to Japan, uh, we were ordered to go on in uh, to Curie Harbor, K-U-R-E, five miles from Nagasaki, where uh, we had just dropped the second uh, atomic bomb. And uh, I had shark patrol duty in those ruins. Uh, why? It was typical service. Uh, not that I frown on the service. I, I love the service, but here I am standing out in nothing but rubble and waste and hundreds of Japanese civilians with everything they carried on their backs, walking out of these, this rubble on one side and on the other side of the road was the same amount of them walking back in. And I often wondered, where are they going? They have no place to go, what, what, what are they going to do? And I never answered that question, but uh, I had short patrol duty at Nagasaki. What, what got you there? I mean, you just again briefly. You were last. We were talking. You were in 
Liverpool and in the Atlantic, and then next thing you know, we're in the Pacific. How did that happen? We were transport which carried invasion forces. Right. And we had these uh, 30, around 36 LCMs or LCVPs, which we carried to the beaches. Right. For invasion purposes. And, uh, well, that we hit three, four, five places with our invasion troops, and uh, in between time we were always practicing how to get those things in the water as soon as you could possibly do it, get them in the water and get them out of the water and get safe and get out of there and and. Uh, that, that type of thing, a lot of chaos. But after we got proficient at it, we were pretty good at it. We had a, uh, a four five inch 38s on board, along with uh, three inch 50s. Three inch 50s is a pretty good size gun. Uh, and, uh, we used to laugh because there'd be five guys on a, uh, a five-inch 38 gun, and that's the ones that had the canopy on the top of them. You're inside this thing, so every time they fired, the thing just shake everything. And the story was, if you were uh, in there in firing practices, and uh, you're firing quite heavily. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, some guy would reach up like this, and see. if he found blood, he was pretty happy because now well, if he found blood in the other one, they'd discharge him home. <laughs> so uh, that happened in two or three cases where guys came home. Uh, now it wasn't only uh, blood and bleeding, but it was. Weird acting, we call it battle fatigue cases, where people, uh, our own shipmates, would go down in the galley doing off hours and pick up some of the garbage from left from chow and eat eat that with their hands. And uh, I checked out some of those people and found out that. Uh, and they were still alive. They were back home in Brooklyn and places like that when the war ended. Uh, nice people and so forth, but they had battle fatigue. Wasn't, what do they call it now? Uh, what do you got? What do you, we call it post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah. All kinds of names, yeah. Shell shock, same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I always get a charge out of the way things are handled over the years. Uh, in that when I came home, <coughs> home, I was still only 19 years old and uh, going to college. Yeah, but Previous to that, when I got discharged, there were a bunch of us. We were we were shipped to Detroit to a discharge center, and uh, they had a point system. If you were married, you got points for going home. Uh, if you'd been in combat, you got points. Uh, if you had children, they gave you points. And the more points you had, the closer you were to getting discharged at that time. You know, I can remember some of the lines were, uh, well, you go around this room a couple of times, and people waiting to be discharged. And as the people left, and they were talking to the people who were, doing the discharges, what do you suppose the number one question was? <laughs> you got when you went through the line. 
Uh, the answer was no. no. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> you know, you had your answer already when you got up there in front. Do you, you want to re uh, enlist? Do you want to go and uh, set up another area for control? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. And uh, you're setting up the reserve that way, but we. We had never been ashore or had a uh, reprieve or furlough all the time I was on board the ship. So when we got to, when we came back from Europe, we went to, our ship stopped at Norfolk. Half the crew were discharged and the other half uh, we had to stay behind and scrape the barnacles off the bottom of the ship in, uh, when she was in dry dock. And uh, when they, uh, we got back and the war ended, we, we were on our way to uh, Manila with our ship all loaded, getting ready for that invasion of Japan. Uh, but when the, the war ended and so forth. We, uh, uh, some of the guys were discharged and the younger guys, like myself, uh, we'd been there but we didn't have enough points. We weren't married, we didn't have children and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, so we kind of had to argue our way through just to get enough points to, to get discharged and to be able to say, no, I don't want to go. Well, when we went on leave, we, we were given uh, 60 days furlough, 12 days travel time across the United States. Well, one of my friends was from Rochester, New York. Funny little guy from uh, Rochester. He found out that uh, 60 days plus 12 wasn't enough for him. <laughs> so I'm, I'm leaving to be discharged and he's going back in the camp he's five days late. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so the war ended and uh, it was some time later I'd been discharged. Uh, I went to Rochester to see him. Found out that when he got back off his 72 days or whatever the heck it was. Uh, they put him on a, uh, 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 a ship that goes around uh, blowing up uh, buoys and so forth. Uh, just an ordinary ship that was always on control duty, uh, protecting what was left of our shores and so forth. He spent another year on board of, uh, <laughs> what the heck was that ship called? Special name to it. Uh, he had spent another year. Minesweeper? Minesweeper, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> oh boy, was he steaming because of that. Well, what the heck, he asked for it, you know. I was just going to say, <laughs> you know, going back to Nagasaki, uh, you, were at, you were an eyewitness to something which we've just seen about in newsreels. When you first encountered that shore leave and you saw the devastation, what did you think? Oh my God. Uh, take this room and crumble it in your hands. Uh, you got ashes. Once in a while there'd be a chimney standing someplace. Uh, families with little kids chasing them down the road. Nobody knows where they were going. Uh, turmoil, uh, the whole thing. You, what? You, you kept feeling so sorry for those people because you didn't know where they were going. They didn't know where they were going. And, and it was nothing but just rubble. What, what good would it do to walk back into that pile of mess that they inherited due to that atomic uh, bombing? 
And boy, that caused trouble. I'm telling you so. Mm. I'm glad I got out of there. It wasn't, it wasn't fun. I, it, was, it was just it was terrible for those people. The actual bombing occurred uh, August 9th, 1945. Were you there shortly thereafter? Well, I was there five days after the, they dropped the second atomic bomb. Yeah, wow. Yeah. What did the people, did they come up to you as you know, military? I mean, they know who bombed them. Did they react to you? Did they throw stones at you? Did they do anything? No. They were very placid. They moved about with their heads down, the little kids trailing them behind, uh, very subdued, very quiet. You could, uh, well, I, I couldn't say you could hear a pin drop, it wasn't much noise. Uh, it was all very quiet. They, uh, I very seldom saw those people talking to themselves. They were families by themselves, going up and down the road, and once in a while somebody would fall on the side and they'd ask for a doctor or something like that. But then they, uh, <laughs> the stench got terrible. Uh, they came along and with bulldozers and covered up the dead over their so-called main highways, but you could still smell it. That wasn't very pleasant at all. That was. Had they, before you were put on shore, did they tell you much, of anything about what happened? No. The only thing we knew was that, well, the, even now, I kind of have a hard time associating him, but with a, uh, somewhere in there, President Roosevelt died. We were, I think we were on our way to Japan at the time. Yeah, he died in April of 45, yeah. Okay, okay. This would have been in August. Yeah. Yeah. And probably at that time, we were on our way uh, through Curie, K-U-R-E, Curie Harbor, mm -hmm. to dock and to uh, take over as uh, being in charge of the country at that time. They accepted us. There was nothing fishy about it at all. They just, uh, they did what they were told. Uh, they went wherever the people directed them to go, but where, where could you direct them? What do you do? You, you know, you just, that was a terrible mess. And the war ended shortly thereafter, I mean, literally. Yeah, and, and uh, well, we went there, my ship alone went on the other side of Japan, picking up uh, wounded Japanese people as well as American, and, and taking them on the hospital ship back to the United States. Uh, for uh, medical attention, stuff like that. Uh, and that's when, uh, well, right around the beginning of that, when the uh, the hospital ship, I think it was called the Hornet. Mm -hmm. She went down. Uh, she was from here over the length of five or six football fields from where we were uh, sitting watching the whole thing. Uh, and this was on the Japanese side of, of Japan. So that, that, was, uh, that was quite exhilarating. Uh, <laughs> a funny story. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one of my better friends was Bill Bastion from Rochester. And we were somewhere along the way, we were in a number of skirmishes uh, in the Pacific. And we were in between uh, a 
automatic firing and red alerts. And uh, we had some time off. Smoking lamp was lit. <laughs> oh boy, did we smoke. <laughs> Everybody lit up whether they smoked or not. <laughs> and uh, my friend Bill Bastian was sitting on the rim. They call it a rim, but you wouldn't use that term in the surface. Uh, on the edge of the uh, of a drop off, going three decks down. This is where they loaded jeeps, tanks, uh, troops, uh, anything for invasion purposes. That's where they carried them into the beach. Well, Billy Bastian, while he was talking with me and another kid, disappeared. <laughs> what the heck happened? Well, he had fallen backwards down into the hole. <laughs> oh, gosh. And uh, he was down there. We said, well, we better get him out of there. And, and we called uh, some relief. We took him out on a stretcher. And uh, we had, uh, our ship was controlled by booms. Uh, which carried boats with loaded armaments in them from the ship to the shore. And uh, we took him off in a litter. He went over the side. Uh, at the at number one dock, uh, surface level. And uh, I was standing there and he winked at me. And I man, this guy, <laughs> this is really something. <laughs> so, uh, lost track of him. Now, we had been discharged to go home. Uh, my ship docked at Tacoma, Washington. Uh, some of the guys were transported to uh, the uh, naval base in Tacoma. And, uh, I lost track of Billy, but then I was, I had, oh, I needed three or four points or something like that. I was so young. They left me there at the Tacoma, gave me a job in the office. And that was the only time I ever volunteered anything in the service. Uh, I went to work in their office, entertaining troops coming in from the Pacific and taking out their discharge points, putting them on a trail back to a discharge center where they then could be discharged from the service if they wanted to be so. And, uh, well, uh, <laughs> it was kind of crazy the way that the whole thing went. Uh, anyway, uh, how the heck did that happen? Well, anyway, when I got there, oh, when this was before uh, Billy got out of service, or I got out of service, or other guys got out of service, uh, uh, three or four of us found out that Billy, he's the guy who had been late getting back up, being in service this year. Uh, uh, they had given him an extra year on the minesweeper, and uh, uh, he found out about that. Well, so we visited him in Seattle. He was still in the hospital, and they were wheeling him around in a wheelchair <laughs> all over the campus. And when he went by me, he gave me another wink. <laughs> you and Bill Bastion are quite oh, a legend. Boy. Okay, and you know what he did the rest of his life? He peddled mail on the street. Was that right? <laughs> he, could, he couldn't walk in service, but he, he, spent, he had a nice big uh, money coming in on a weekly basis. <laughs> uh, he took this job as a mail carrier. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> and the last thing I knew, he was still alive. I don't know. He's still in, 
still in Rochester. I don't know. But uh, you have you had an incredible experience here. What's the question I should be asking you, Doc? What's what's that moment that you you're ready to tell us, but I haven't asked you the question about uh, the war during the wartime period? Uh, it would be an emotion only to me. Uh, we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. All of the ships in that fleet, now this was Bull Halsey's troops, Admiral Bull. There was a time there toward the end of the war with Japan when uh, God's honest truth, a torpedo went between our buoyed anchor and our ship, oh. between the nose, went right through the gap in there. Uh, the Japanese were sending kamikaze uh, pilots by the hundreds. All they had left, they were throwing it at us. One day we shot down over 90, not my ship alone, but the fleet that I was in shot down 99 kamikaze pilots right over our heads. And we were given credit for quite a few of those. And, and uh, the thing that bothered me most about all of that and all of this turmoil and the chaos and everything else, uh, there was a let up. Our troops could not establish a wide enough spread to say this operation is more or less over and we have control of it as such. But we were not at a uh, fire when ready, fire at will situation. Uh, we were at buoy. This would have been about oh, half a mile offshore from where the battle was being placed. And we were tied up alongside another ship. Lots of times that's the way we buoyed out there. We'd put two or three ships together. And that was our homemade port, so to speak, while the battle was really going on. Well, we were tied up at Ulysses with a, another ship, and, and it was got to be an awful storm. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever remember the hurricanes that hit around that area at that time. But we were in that. And we had a kid there, kind of a uh, hopeless little guy. I don't know where he was from, but he hadn't been out in the world very often, I don't think. He had to go uh, help tie up one uh, ship to another to buoy one another. And we tied up alongside another sh a ship, and the weather was rough, and uh, uh, everything was going to a point where you didn't quite grasp what was going on until was, we were in this storm. He had to go out and tie up this one ship against another ship. The last thing I remember was that arm Going down. Oh gosh. Terrible. Terrible. He had to be there. Yeah. So, what are you going to do? <laughs> but uh, we weren't firing at anybody. This was Mother Nature. It, <coughs> it was so reminiscent of the war. It's, uh, didn't make sense. You know, it's just, you gotta live it and then uh, forget it. So, those, those are things that I remember. And uh, I'll never forget them. You know, what the heck. Uh, you had you, you uh, <coughs> keep asking yourself why. 
never had an answer. Yep. To this day, there's a poor guy who went over there, he was drafted, slipped, fell between two landing barges, and all you could see was that arm going down. You couldn't, a lot of things run through your mind to wonder uh, if his parents only knew uh -huh. what happened, how it happened, and what kind of people they were, and so forth. So after the war, I did stop on my way south. My wife and I used to go to Florida. And there was a guy there from West Virginia, his name was Jim Brooks. He lived right in the deepest hills of West Virginia. So I said well, to my wife, well, we're going to stop and see if Jim's still alive and if I could see him. And this is signed, this is probably two or three years after the war had ended. Sure enough, this is a funny reaction. Uh, I said, we'll stop and see Jim. Well, in order to get to the place where he lived in West Virginia, you had to, you couldn't go. He lived over here and you were on this side of a river and you could not get there from here. You had to go down here about two miles across and then back two miles to get where Jim was. And uh, I went through there and I knocked on the door. I didn't, I had not announced to anybody who we were, what we were doing there, why we were there, what have you. The lady came to the door, took one look at me, threw her arms around me. <laughs> Never seen this lady in my life. She says, I've been waiting for you. Uh, he had died since uh, that whole situation was there. And uh, I said to her, how'd you meet Jim and so forth? And she went through the typical hillbilly. Uh, well, she, she set her cap for me. When he came home, I set my, I set my cap for him. And a uh, big picture of him on a wall. And uh, uh, I thought to myself, wow, uh, here's a poor guy who went through it all. And his family still was there. They were, at that time, they were having a big party for him. And uh, when I, we went outside afterwards to continue on our trip to Florida, I, you could reach out and take your finger and wipe the coal dust off his car. It was parked in the driveway. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what a way to live, you yeah. know. <laughs> and there are people still down there doing that, I guess. I don't know. But uh, th those are things that I remember. Well, you remember them very well, Doc. I am so thrilled. You shared that. And by the way, I got to get the spelling again of your ship. It was the C. C E T H E U S. C E T H E P H. P H. It's a name after a star. Cepheus. Okay, perfect. C E T H E U S. All right. Well, I thank both you and Rich Dixon for bringing you down, and we've got some food for you, too. So we're going to put you at a table so you can have breakfast. <laughs> Would that be okay? Well, I guess I've been a pain in the neck here. I, I, uh... We've got good stuff for you, because if you don't eat it, we will. <laughs> we're going to get a couple pictures, so don't go away. Okay.